Morning. So I'm Aaron Gratifiori. I work at a company called Isaac Partners that's based out of San Francisco. Uh, we have an office in New York and uh, Seattle as well. This is Josh Ivor. He's a coworker of mine. And uh, this is The Outer Limits. And The Outer Limits was a 50s sci-fi show that was really cheesy. Um, but the introduction had this very kind of funny thing where they talked about that you no longer controlled your TV, that now they control the picture and the vertical and the horizontal and all the different parts and you know that you could no longer change the channel. And of course you could change the channel, but it was kind of a joke that they had. But we thought, well maybe we could do that now with you know some, some attacks. So does anybody here know what movie this is from? Nope, well, it's maybe before your time, exactly. So what he's doing here is, he's actually putting on the outer limits, and you can see it there in the, the, uh, the corner there, and he's, you know, he wants to watch that show. And this movie, Enemy of the State, Will Smith is actually watching himself on his own TV. So we're thinking, you know, it would be great if we can make that happen. Um, so we performed our research in December of last year. And uh, we reported the issues that we found to Samsung in uh, early of January of this year. And you know, they, they, we worked with them to work on some fixes and get some through some things. And they uh, you know, issued, pass issued some patches. And you know, they said, okay, you guys can talk about it now. We've got you know, people fixed. And, um, and uh, you know, after June, you can talk about it. So we spoke at Black Hat. And uh, now we're speaking here to you guys. So, you know, we know a lot about smartphones, and everybody has one, right? You can see, you know, the uh, iOS uh, 7 development uh, line on the bottom there. And, you know, everybody has a smartphone. I'm sure everybody here has a smartphone. And, you know, there's lots of other smart devices. We've got smart watches, smart cars, smart fridges that have Wi Fi, smart windows. Even smart houses, and uh, you know, this is a movie that came out in the early 2000s before we even actually had smart houses. And we even have smart toilets. And this is not a joke. In Japan, you can buy a very, very expensive toilet that actually has Bluetooth, and you can, you know, use your smartphone to uh, raise and lower the seat because maybe you know you're you're scared of germs. But you know, we're here to find about about the smart TV. And um, so let's look at how that. And so we started thinking, well, you know, there's lots of apps. And there's apps on my phone. And I know how those work. And you know, we, we deal with security of mobile applications at ISEC. And we know a lot about how to secure those. But I don't really know how the apps work for a TV. And, and so let's look at that. And so you know, just like a smartphone, a TV has a front-facing camera. And just like a smartphone, a TV has lots of applications. And it also has a web browser. And it also has social media applications. And there's a backup service. And so, you know, we were wondering, you know, how does how do these applications work? And you know, what is what does all this mean? And so, you know, let's let's get our heads in the game. So if we, we look at the TV, we can um, you know, look at it kind of like a computer. So it has uh, a one gigahertz arm, just like a phone. Um, it has the HDMI, it has USB and all kinds of things just like a, a, a modern smartphone or a laptop. And you know, if we start looking at the software side of things, it's a, a Linux-based operating system. It has an app store, just like the Google Play Store or uh, the iOS app store. Uh, it has the web browser and Facebook like we talked about. But what all those things really mean is that those are what we call attack surfaces. So every time you're, you know, uh, if you think about it like a castle, Right, a castle has a drawbridge that lowers and raises, and that makes it so that it's really hard for people to get in. And the more you know doors that you have in your castle, the more drawbridges you have to allow people in, the more that's a, a, vulner a possible uh, point of vulnerability. So when we have the same kind of thing for a TV, we think, okay, well, you know, there's the USB. Maybe we can figure out some bugs there. There's um, the network stack, and maybe there's you know attacks over the network, and uh, you know. But really, we focused on the applications. And um, if you think about it from an applications perspective, after you, know, you have some code uh, running on the TV, 
there's all different kinds of things that you can attack then. You know, the, the kernel, which powers the operating system behind the TV, you can go and try to, you know, find bugs in that. Or the, you can um, mess with the, the files that are on the TV to make it do things that it wasn't intended to do. So we started with documentation because we didn't actually have a TV and we were curious how all this stuff fits together. And we found things like, you know, how to do some of the uh, account reads or um, um, they mention things uh, that developers kind of are curious about. You know, there's a, this notion of secure storage and that, that's kind of strange. Now, how does that work? And, you know, we see some more things about executing things and JavaScript and lots of scary stuff. But, you know, let's talk a little bit about what a smart TV application actually is and, and how it works. So the smart TV applications, um, for any of you who have played around with uh, web applications, have, have any of you actually like built anything in JavaScript, HTML, kids out there? I see two hands. Well, that's good. Um, so if you look at the file, files here that are the basic application components for the applications on the smart TV, it might look pretty familiar. You have uh, an XML file that is just a, a configuration file. The index.html, and for those of you who have uh, played around with, uh, with web apps before, that's typically like the default page that loads when you visit a website. There's a JavaScript file, or mini JavaScript files, depending on the sizes and uh, functions of the application. And then there's a CSS file, which just uh, makes everything pretty. It, it handles all of the formatting and things like that. Um, one of the cool things about working with smart TVs is that there are emulators and virtual machines available for this. So you actually don't have to go out and buy a fancy smart TV from Samsung in order to play around with making applications. You can actually download a uh, virtual machine to your laptop and actually play around with that and code in it um, on your regular lap laptop operating system. So that's something that um, wasn't uh, as available when we started doing this, this uh, research as it is today, and uh, that, that's gotten a lot better. So it's, it's, a, mu it's a much easier um, platform to start playing around with. So let's take a look at some of these files. So when you're taking a look at an application and trying to figure out like, what the guts are and like, what it actually does and what it's allowed to do, the configuration is a really good place to start. It tells you some like the really basic things like, hey, this is obviously the configuration for, uh, for Skype because it says, hey, the, uh, the, the CP name is Skype. Um, but sometimes you get to see uh, find some, uh, a little bit some things that are a little bit um, a little more odd. Um, so, for example, there's uh, some things uh, within the configuration files that we found, like the author. And the author in this case was um, something that just kind of stood out to us because um, what we noticed was that the, uh, the application that was a, a partner with um, the, plat the Smart TV platform provided the actual like libraries and binaries and, and uh, the, 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 the core guts of the application to, um, to the developer. And then it was actually the TV developer that um, made the application. So we thought, hmm, if that's something that is true for other apps, maybe there's certain things within the code that will carry over between all these different popular applications. So that's something that you can just get right out of the configuration and uh, kind of build up an attack plan um, when you're trying to do some research. So the, uh, the index file um, really just looks like a really basic website. <clears throat> and what it does is it actually tells the uh, smart TV what other code it needs to load. In this case, most of it's JavaScript. And so it says, OK, um, in order to run this application, you need to load this JavaScript file and open it up, and then this JavaScript file and open it up. So once we were able to learn how to read these from all these applications that we found on the TV, we were able to figure out, OK, so an application like Skype needs to use the camera that's built into the TV. So what if we read through how it loads that, that code and figure out if we can plug it into another application or maybe even later on the web browser and figure and, and see if we can actually also load the camera from those applications that weren't supposed to be able to access the camera. And then this is just a quick sample of uh, some of the JavaScript that you might come across in a uh, smart TV application. This one's um, straight out of Skype, and uh, it, it, it just pulls uh, something called My Storage Info. And you'd expect that to return something like your, your uh, Skype information is stored at like this, this uh, directory or folder on your, your uh, smart TV. But we'll come back to this a bit later, because that one was a little bit odd. Now, parents, you'll probably recognize this very, very famous child hacker. Um, for, the, for the younger kids, you might not know who this is. But when we, Aaron and I, were looking at the smart TV applications, we saw all these files and we're like, hmm, these are web apps. We know web apps, which is a play on the very famous line from this child hacker. So uh, with that, Aaron's going to hop in. 
and talk about how the applications can actually interface with the smart TV itself and the underlying hardware. So the, the you know having a, a website that doesn't actually you know go anywhere or do anything is kind of boring. So you know what happens is the application has to use these things called APIs, and that stands for Application Programming Interface. And essentially, what that means is it's a door from the HTML into the operating system to do something like write a file or connect to a, a network address or, uh, or you know do something uh, to an IP, things like that. And so you know these APIs provide different things, and there's a whole number of those. So there's all kinds of APIs um, that do all kinds of different things that you know we uh, as a you know security experts want to investigate more in how they work and what they do. And there's tons of these APIs. There's you know there's different kinds of APIs. There's different APIs for dealing with the TV, with dealing with the network, things like that. So we thought, okay, well let's you know. Let's take an application and we'll put some malicious file in it and see if we can get that to be run when we install it. So we put the TV in the developer mode, uh, which is just logging in as the, the, the name develop. And we see this message, failed to install, please visit this security page. So we're like, hmm. And it turns out what it was is there's a little thing that checks to see, is there a executable binary called an ELF on Linux, E-L-F. And it says, is there an ELF in this file? And the code that's looking at the application when you install it says yes. And so it blocks that install. So we were thinking, hmm, how can we bypass that? So because it's looking at that and because it's looking at some of the other code that we wrote, it's actually analyzing that and, and kind of trying to filter out some things, kind of like event antivirus in a way. And so what we did is we just kind of did something called obfuscation. And we just made the JavaScript code that normally looks you know, readable and easy and we just turned it into garbly gook. So, but still, we were caught red-handed. We couldn't, you know, get our malicious code installed, and you know that, that made us kind of sad. So then we noticed that there's a zip function, and that can package things. So we thought, okay, let's put our our elf binary inside of our zip, and then we'll unzip it, and maybe that'll hide it from the scanner. And it turns out that it did hide it from the scanner. So when we were looking at the smart hub, which is the main part of the, the TV when you have it booted and there's all the applications and things, um, we looked and, and saw you know, user code and normal code, and then we saw manager. And we thought, that was interesting, weird. And there's all these very important sounding files, you know, smart home and EMP and common, and uh, you know, we're curious about that. And what it turns out is that all those files are actually controlling the smart TV itself. So not only are the applications written in JavaScript and HTML, but the OS that you're normally using to launch those is also written in JavaScript and HTML. So this is the picture of the smart TV, and you can see there, you know, it has lots of applications and a web browser and things. And it turns out that, again, that whole thing, all of that, is actually kind of like a website. And so, again, we were thinking, hmm, well, we know a lot about web application attacks because we get paid to hack things. And so, hmm, that's interesting. But again, this is all local. You know, we want to be able to do things remotely, right? That's the scary part. So who knows here what HTML stands for? Yes. So hypertext markup language is how the web browser, how the internet works. Uh, or how they, you know, when, you, when you're surfing the web, which is now an old term, uh, you, you know, are looking at websites. Th those are mostly powered by HTML. And I'm sure some of you know HTML and, and have written some websites probably even earlier than, than I started. So just to give an example of how that can kind of go bad, this is a, a pretty basic example. So what happens is there's this JavaScript part of the top, and it takes some input. And, it's, it and we can see there that it's expecting a name which is what var name means. So var name input Aaron, my name. And then what happens is when I visit that page, uh, the code of the page in HTML says, hello Aaron, welcome to Roots. But how can that go bad? So instead of my name Aaron, what if I put in there some other HTML? So I put in a blink. And the blink tag does obviously make it blink. Um, and then I put in h1. And that makes it big. So 
Does anybody know what's going to happen when now when I visit the site? Exactly. Now when I visit the site, it's going to say hello, and then Josh is going to be really big and blinking. And so, you know, if this was a, a some other website and it wasn't it wasn't intended to have, you know, if it was my website and he could just put his name on it, you know, that that might make me angry. So let's talk a little bit about some of the social media applications that are on the TV. So just like your smartphone, um, smart TVs are pretty popular for use with so social applications, and all the typical social media applications are available on it. Um, some of them are even custom made for uh, just for use with other smart TV users. But um, for our, our research, we wanted to focus on um, uh, really, really popular, well-established, um, and uh, and uh, uh, social media applications where you're going to have lots of friends and contacts. And the reason we wanted lots of friends and contacts is because if you think about it, social media networks always have something called remote content injection. What that means is that on your phone, you don't actually control what information appears on your phone when your friends update their Facebook status or send you a message on Skype or something like that. Somebody else is actually in control of the content that appears on your device. And so one of the things that we know for sure is that there are lots of people that use social media that have their accounts um, be compromised and hacked. And we've, you may have seen that before where some of your friends' accounts start posting random links and then they come on and they're embarrassed and they say, please don't click on those, I got hacked. So we're thinking, okay, so with that JavaScript and HTML, um, what's called an injection attack that Aaron was talking about, what if we took something that was slightly more, more malicious than saying, hey, what's up? and put that into social media applications and sent it to people on smart TVs. Would that actually render or be executed inside of that social media application, or would it just show up as the text, you know, script alert, hey, what's up, end script? And I, I will tell you that when we were doing this uh, testing, my family got really confused because they were online at the same time I was doing the testing, and they had no idea what I was saying to them. So before we actually get into the, the attack itself, let's take a look at uh, some of the, uh, the, the social, social media networks that we'd want to take, uh, take a look at. We were thinking, hmm, the smart TV is a really great platform for video communication. For those of you who've tried to do like FaceTime or Skype on your phone, you know that sometimes it's difficult to like keep yourself in the frame or like flip cameras and turn around so that the person you're talking to can actually see what you want them to see. But with a TV, it's actually mounted to the wall. It's got a really nice camera, a big screen, and you can just sit on your couch and talk. So it's a really great platform for that. So we're thinking, okay, it's really likely that people will start using Skype or, or something equivalent to that um, on this platform. So, of course, we're asking, what's the best target? And in this case, it's Skype. Now, it's important to note that um, the issues that we're going to talk about um, aren't actually issues that were within Skype itself. The issues were within how the application on the smart TV that talked to Skype was built. Okay, so there's an important distinction there. So Skype has access to the camera. Um, it's got all these uh, remote content injection areas through, uh, through messages and chat. And what's really cool is that there's automatic signing capability. So if you were able to do something bad to it and, and uh, you, uh, you had a user who automatically signed in every time they turned the TV on, there's a good chance you could probably leave code on there and have it rerun every time they log in. So when we were looking at Skype, what we found was that there were those injection vulnerabilities just about everywhere. And we're going to take a, take a quick look at some of the pictures from that. Um, but basically, it boiled down to even if I was just using the keyboard and I input script um, or uh, JavaScript or HTML into my name in a, or into my uh, profile name or into a contact that I was adding, that would actually show up in the application. So let's take a look at that. So this. Uh, I think you can still see that. Um, in the middle of the name here, there's an image tag, which is an HTML tag that's supposed to download an image and show it. And when it fails, it shows like a default image, and that's what you see up there. So I put an image tag in my name, and we're thinking, oh, hey, this is, you know, this is really cool research. Um, it's, it's, a, it's bad as far as security goes, but this is something that we're going to dig into. And then remotely, what we found was that when my user talked to our, our smart TV user, and my, um, my mood message or status was updated to include that image tag, it also showed up on the screen. So let's have some fun with that. At the top here, you see the mood message that we had to set um, in Skype that would then show up in our, uh, our smart TV user. 
And what it did was it said, okay, here's some JavaScript. We want you to download this other JavaScript file from our website. And in the bottom there, you actually see that JavaScript code. And you don't really need to know too much about it um, as far as like what it's doing at the top part. But at the very bottom, one of the things that we found with uh, the API system that Aaron talked about earlier was that we could actually call this uh, the file plugin copy command and actually execute system commands like we were actually like um, at a command line console. And so we we're actually able to turn off the operating system within the uh, smart TV. So if we changed our status or sent you a message on Skype while you were on a smart TV, you'd see it for a split second and then your TV would reboot. And that's just silly and fun and you know, it's a, it's a mild annoyance. So let's see what else we could do that's a little bit, uh, I don't know, more evil. So our, uh, our, the next thing that we did with Skype was we pulled down more code and this one actually was able to use that, uh, that API call that we looked at earlier, the get my storage info. The weird thing about that one was that not only did it return where you stored your stuff, it also returned the username and password of the Skype user. And if we put that into an image tag and told the, uh, the, the, the Skype application that you should get an image, image from our website that we control and the image name is this information, we would get a log on our web server that said that, that this IP address, this Skype user, um, downloaded this, is calling for this image, and in our logs we would see your username and password. So that's, that's a bit more evil. All right. Aaron's so just just like just like uh, you know the social media applications, the browser is also a, a big uh, attack surface that we wanted to look at. And so we thought, okay, we have some way of uh, getting into the browser's code, just like with Skype. And uh, we didn't go into that because it's a, a bit more detailed, and, and we're kind of getting low on time. But essentially, there's a, an API that we can call that that had a vulnerability before we reported it. Um, and essentially what that does is it allows us to open the file that controls where the DNS settings are stored, which is resolve.conf there. And the trick is that those dot dot slashes actually make it open up directories uh, from where it is. So if you think about it, you know, you have your, your C drive or your root FS or, uh, and all the way down in there, there's files. And so what we did is we told it to read a file from here but then the name, and in, in inside the name, we included the code of the file system to, and told it to read a file that was way up here. So that lets us change the name of where it asks for things, uh, where they are on the internet. So when you go to google.com, you know, your, your uh, TV says, where is google.com to your router? And it says, okay, it's this IP. And so what we did is we said, no, you're not going to ask your router anymore. You're going to ask us where it is. So now we can say, oh, Google.com, oh yeah, that's Yahoo. And so there's some other things we can do from the browser. So let's see how the camera stuff works. And I, I have to pull up a video, it's gonna take a second. <coughs> While Aaron's pulling that up, um, one thing that's important to note too is that because we disclose this responsibly, everything that we're showing you here has been fixed. So what you'll see here is this site that we build, and then uh, in a quick second, the camera is going to actually pop up inside the browser, and it's going to show you what it's looking at. And it's actually looking at a coworker, or a friend of mine, and he's going to bounce out of the screen, right, because he doesn't want to see himself on TV. And so and I'll, I'll play it one more time because it kind of was kind of quick. But um, essentially there is the camera viewing it. Uh, what, you know, you see what the camera sees, and um, you know, he realizes it and, and uh, he uh, fails. So we had to do some extra work to actually have that video show up on the screen in a uh, real life attack that would actually be hidden behind the browser and you would never know that the camera is actually on. So uh, I wanted to definitely talk about responsible disclosure because it's, it's kind of a, a big deal in the industry now. But essentially responsible disclosure is, you know, researchers like us come up with, you know, we perform this research, um, and um, we say, uh, you know, we provide the, the, the findings to the company and say, here's how to reproduce it, here's how you should fix it, talk, if you want to talk to us more, you know, go for it. But essentially, we're going to let you, before we talk about it at all, we're going to let you guys fix it. 
And so it, it really helps keep people safer. And there's this other thing called a bug bounty. And so essentially what a bug bounty is, is it says, okay, instead of just having, you know, you provide those findings, the company will now actually pay you some money for finding those on your, on your kind of own time. And so both Samsung and Facebook have bug bounties. And we didn't submit to any bug bounties for the, all, the, all the, you know, 15 or so findings that we had. But um, what we're going to try to do is, after this, we're going to bring the TV that we brought that's somewhere down there uh, over to the other room, and we're going to have you guys give a shot at finding some new bugs, brand new O'Day bugs, that you'll then not tell anybody about, but we'll let you guys report it to Samsung kind of through us or, or through Nico, and essentially possibly get you guys some money uh, for both EFF and for, you know, school supplies and, you know, maybe an, another ticket to DEF CON, um, things like that. And so, you know, it's really kind of giving people uh, money and there's lots of benefits for this, right? So users and consumers are, are, are now made safer through, through um, you know, research. And, uh, you know, consumers are made safer that use the product, whether that's a website or a TV or a phone or, or some other platform. And, uh, you know, the researcher gets a bit of money to, you know, possibly go to, to Disneyland or DEF CON or, you know, whatever uh, age-appropriate thing they're at. And, you know, this, this kind of attack that we're talking about here is going to become more and more popular as more and more devices are built purely out of HTML and JavaScript. And that's something that, you know, we wanted to bring up to the industry and we talked a lot more about it at Black Hat. But essentially, you know, just like normal web applications, Web app or, uh, applications that are written in HTML and JavaScript need to have their input filters. You know, a, web, a website shouldn't have SQL injection, just like a local application shouldn't have SQL injection. And so, you know, big thanks to some of our coworkers at, at ISEC Partners. Big thanks to Nico, to, to Samsung for working um, well with us issue and kind of maintaining communication with us, and um, and some some other researchers there as well. So, uh, with that, um, are there any questions? Okay, well, um, I think we're going to be going to the other area, and then, um, you know, you can always come up to me afterwards and, and ask about how we did this or, or anything like that. Thanks.